started. Um, my name is Maria Nicanor. I'm the executive director of the Design Alliance. Um, thank you all for coming tonight for what I believe is our eighth lecture in the Rice Architecture and RDA Lecture Series. Tonight we have uh, Frank Escher and Robbie Benwardena here with us. Um, it's, uh, it's a special pleasure to have them here tonight because um, they were kind enough, and Frank was kind enough to um, to tour us around uh, one of the projects or in house in LA earlier this year. So it's kind of a treat to have them here to tell us more about that project tonight. And um, we'll hear more about their practice in a moment, but it's uh, they, they are based in LA, as you know, and uh, do a lot of work collaborating with artists, but of course they become quite well known for the Eames House restoration and also uh, John Locker's Chemosphere uh, restoration that are two of the projects that we're all looking forward to, to hearing more about tonight. Um, but they work with uh, museums, they've done extensive work with uh, the archives of several notable architects. Um, so it's a wide ranging um, career and we're really looking forward to, to hearing more from you. We'll have a little bit of time for questions after, so if you want to stick around, there'll be a mic for that. And uh, with, with that, I think we'll, we'll welcome Frank and Robbie. Uh, first of all, uh, Maria, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you uh, to RICE and the uh, RICE Design Alliance for this invitation. We're actually very uh, uh, excited to be here. Uh, it's not our first trip to Houston. We've been asked a number of times, uh, but it's the first time that we will have time to actually enjoy some of the cultural institutions here. Uh, we've also actually over the years uh, had had uh, three people from uh, Rice uh, working in our office. Uh, so that was always uh, really interesting. Um, about two years ago, uh, a monograph uh, was published on our work with the title uh, clocks and Clouds. Uh, we borrowed the title from Karl uh, 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 Popper and his uh, lecture uh, and essay uh, titled On uh, Clouds and uh, Clocks. Uh, for us, uh, for Ravi and me, uh, we uh, were always um, interested in the idea uh, uh, what in our discipline in architecture is measurable and what is not measurable. Uh, we have always been interested in what we call accidental forms or um, uh, accidental decoration, uh, which is uh, something that develops in a project without it being designed uh, by us, uh, uh, without uh, us controlling the construction process or without us controlling how the user actually uses the building. Um, in this um, uh, and uh, this uh, idea maybe applies more to uh, our uh, new built work, uh, but uh, uh, you will see some projects where the idea of cloud actually should be apparent and one could actually argue that history itself is uh, really a cloud. In this monograph, uh, the uh, American uh, and LA based architectural historian uh, Paulette Singley wrote an essay where she compared our work in our office to what is called a catoptric box. We didn't know what that was, but she explained it to us. And so these are objects or pieces of furniture in the 15th, 16th century uh, that would have these uh, wedge-shaped uh, uh, small uh, spaces within, and these would be mirrored. And so you would look into these sort of mirrored segments, and in there you would have uh, small vignettes or scenes or uh, 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 different little miniature worlds and all of these very different sort of uh, uh, scenes would then be combined into a whole into this uh, uh, catoptric box and she uh, felt that our office uh, uh, reminded uh, her of, of that. Uh, there is really a very broad range of uh, uh, projects as was mentioned uh, that we do uh, but uh, we argue that in our case uh, these uh, 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 segments are not completely separated. At least, I would argue, we have two-way mirrors uh, in, in, in our uh, segments. Um, but to give you just a very quick overview of uh, this, uh, so we of course do new buildings, which is what most other architects do, 
So these are things like uh, a house that we did at the beginning of our career. On, it sits on two concrete towers. It was built on a very difficult site, so we, we lifted the whole house off the ground on this construction with these two towers and the two steel beams. This is another house that we call the house on six legs, uh, six towers. You drive underneath the house, you park, and then there's a stair that takes you up into the house. Uh, other uh, houses uh, are the solar right. In this case, uh, three volumes that are stacked on top of each other. The different sizes of the volumes are determined by the program. Uh, another house is the house with five corners. Uh, four of these five sides were determined completely by uh, setbacks and geological and structural considerations. Uh, the house uh, uh, sits on a steep slope and there are actually three floors below here built in concrete and they open out to the view and at the top where you have access to a level area, an existing level area, we have a five-sided glass uh, pavilion that is the uh, living room. And then the last one is a house, the house with seven screens. The uh, screen elements that you see are actually the structural element that carries the roof and uh, uh, gives uh, both vertical and lateral support to the roof. But then we also do uh, a lot of art-related work. This is collaborations. Again, the first house that we uh, uh, did, uh, and this was an unbuilt project with the Icelandic artist Olafur Eliasson, and he was proposing to add a 120-foot diameter sun to the house. Uh, it was not built, and he did a different project inside the house. Uh, the second one is a collaboration with the artist Mike Kelly. This was for the Mun uh, Münster sculpture projects. Uh, in 2007. Uh, we've worked for many years with the artist Sharon Lockhart. Uh, this was a project we did at the secession in Vienna. Uh, uh, and uh, the one at the bottom left was for the Venice Biennale about two, three years ago. Uh, the middle uh, uh, project is an exhibition we did on architectural follies for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And it was both a survey of uh, uh, historic follies and at the center we built this uh, 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 folly that allowed you to sort of access a space in the ex exhibition hall that wouldn't normally wouldn't uh, get to. And the last one is a, um, uh, a gallery uh, in Los Angeles called uh, Blum and Poe. But uh, today we really uh, are speaking about uh, architectural history. And uh, as you probably know, uh, Los Angeles has a very interesting um, uh, 20th century architectural history. We always talk of it as a almost laboratory of 20th century architecture. Uh, there's a tradition of experimenting, and it is, it's the same attitude that has led to Los Angeles now being a center of contemporary art. Uh, so these are the things that really sort of shape the cultural topography that uh, we exist in, but it's also to um, uh, uh, aspects of our discipline that interest us, uh, Ravi and me, uh, 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 tremendously. Uh, we don't exist in a cultural vacuum and what has gone around us or before us invariably shapes who we are, whether we are aware of this or not. Um, the uh, French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss speaks of the fruitful illusion that the artist uh, needs who thinks that he or she is original, fruitful because it is an illusion that the artist actually requires to be able to, uh, to um, uh, do their work. Um, we will speak about, uh, about a dozen projects, three of them in more detail, uh, and uh, show you some of the work that we've done in our office. So the first one is this a house called the Chemisphere. It's uh, designed in 1960 by uh, John Lautner. And uh, I uh, did in 1994 the first book on John Lautner. And uh, Lautner actually died uh, just after the book came out. Yesterday would have been the 25 year anniversary of his death, incidentally. Uh, and uh, I was involved in setting up the, La the Lautner Foundation. The archive was donated to that. Uh, I became the administrator for the archive and oversaw that until 2007 when the archive was uh, acquired by the Getty Research Institute where it now is. I have uh, uh, over the years done several 
projects around this, including a large exhibition uh, and, and a second book in collaboration with uh, Jean-Louis Cohen and uh, Nicholas Olsberg. But uh, the um, uh, restoration uh, uh, project uh, uh, was uh, sort of the first of our uh, 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 projects with uh, architectural history. Uh, but before I uh, talk about that, I actually want to very briefly give you an introduction to Lautner's work, since some of uh, you may not be familiar with, uh, with him. Um, uh, the best way to sort of introduce you to his work is to talk about some uh, central ideas, and it's really about how he brings the landscape into the building. Um, you can see this very clearly here in the Arango House in Acapulco, where you have this body of water cir circling around uh, the living room and visually merges with the water of the Pacific beyond. Uh, and you have the same idea in the Perlman Mountain Camp, a very modest wooden structure where you have uh, tree trunks that are the structure uh, and the window frames. And they, of course, echo the forest that surrounds the, uh, the uh, house. Uh, and the forest then becomes sort of the borrowed landscape. Lautner was uh, born 1911. He's, he worked with Frank Lloyd Wright from 1933 to 38. And you see him here behind uh, Wright. Uh, he uh, then comes to Los Angeles, works on a number of projects with Wright, starts his uh, practice quite uh, soon, does at the beginning of his career a number of very interesting uh, timber uh, buildings. Uh, this is the predominant method of, method of construction in Southern California, uh, including this uh, Schaefer house. He extracts actually really interesting spatial and structural ideas from uh, the, uh, 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 the wood construction that he used in a fairly conventional way. Um, he, after the war, does a series of buildings with prefabricated roof structures. This is the uh, uh, Polin house. Uh, all of these are engineered with the engineer Edgardo Contini, who we were talking about uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and in this case, the roof is suspended from these three uh, elements. None of the walls are load-bearing and uh, can actually be moved and uh, open to create an outdoor pavilion from the house. Then from about 1960 on, he starts working with concrete and uh, uh, this is the house at the uh, pivotal point, the uh, uh, Reiner residence or the uh, uh, house known as Silvertop, uh, the Sheets Goldson, which is the house that we visited with some, of, uh, some people from the Design Alliance, uh, which also is from around the same time, and the uh, Elrod house, which is uh, uh, from the late 60s. So th from about 1960 on, as I said, he starts working in concrete and does a number of really interesting projects. Uh, there are some projects like this one, an unbuilt project that he did with um, uh, Felix Candela, the Spanish structural engineer who worked uh, uh, in Mexico most of his life. Uh, and you see here how Lautner starts to become much more uh, expressive and, and developing these uh, very fluid forms. So the chemosphere really sort of comes at this, at this sort of pivotal point in, in his career. He, um, it has a um, concrete column that uh, grows out of a 20-foot diameter concrete disc, which is poured into the bedrock. And it carries eight steel braces that carry eight steel beams. And then there's an additional steel piece that is attached here. Uh, this, the steel structure carries a wood-framed floor and the uh, roof starts with these glue lamp beams that are uh, sitting on these steel extensions. They curve towards the center and they are tied into a steel compression ring at the center. So this is the skeleton of the house. None of the walls inside the house are load-bearing. This again in section you see the column, the steel, and this would be the wooden roof structure that uh, 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 is the roof. Now what is interesting is that Lautner actually used this idea of the mushroom structure uh, in earlier projects. Most of them were not built. So these are projects from the 1940s 
um, uh, single family houses. The idea of the mushroom structure is really something that comes originally from Robert Maillard, the Swiss engineer. Uh, uh, Lautner knew about this through his work uh, with Frank Lloyd Wright on the Johnson family residence and Wright of course used the uh, mushroom structure for the Johnson Wax uh, office building. Uh, Lautner continued to use this idea uh, in a number of unbuilt projects here. This was an, a, a small city where he imagined an entire forest of mushrooms growing from the hill. And uh, lastly, in the 1970s, concrete mushrooms set on top of each other. The only built project uh, with this uh, type of structure was the Sheets apartment building in Westwood, which was the first project for the Sheets family, who then later commissioned the Sheets house, now known as the Sheets uh, Goldstein house. Now the chemisphere uh, uh, is organized um, uh, like this, about, so you uh, access from here, there's a sort of uh, funicular, and then there's a bridge that leads into the house. About half of the house is an open kitchen, dining, living space. Uh, at the center, underneath this sort of steel compression ring that I showed you, uh, where there is a skylight, is a, uh, uh, the hearth. And behind this, uh, and accessed via a corridor, are a series of pie-shaped spaces, uh, laundry uh, uh, space, bedrooms. These originally were separated by a folding wall and the master bedroom and access to the um, uh, uh, bathrooms. Uh, the entrance sequence, so this is when you arrive on the bridge towards the house. Uh, the bedrooms uh, face the hill, so they have a much more intimate relationship to the surrounding landscape, while the uh, living room, uh, which looks faces north, uh, has a view, uh, this very expansive view over the San Fernando Valley. So there's these two very different conditions between uh, the two sides of the house. Uh, uh, a view towards the fireplace and the fireplace as it was in 1960. Uh, this is what the house looked like when our client uh, bought the house. It had gone through several owners. Uh, they all did uh, 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 relatively terrible things to the house where the um, uh, built-in furniture had been removed, surfaces were painted, and uh, uh, all kinds of other uh, things. And so part of the work that we did there was really restoration or reconstruction, like the reconstructing built-in furniture uh, uh, and restoring uh, built-in cabinetry work. But we also made changes to the house, and those changes were based on information that we gathered from the original drawings in Lautner's uh, archive. And it is maybe important to know that the house was not built exactly the way John Lautner wanted it to be built. There were shortcuts that were made during construction, mostly for cost reasons. Uh, and so we uh, uh, addressed uh, some of these. Now, here you see, for example, how these walls were very simply cleaned, uh, furniture that was built in uh, that had been removed was reconstructed. We changed the floor to a floor that Lautner had specified in the original drawings but wasn't done. Uh, we paneled walls that were not uh, paneled originally but Lautner wanted to have paneled like all of uh, these things. Uh, the biggest change that we made uh, was really to the whole uh, glazing system when we replaced the glass with uh, frameless glass uh, to uh, uh, really emphasize the nature of the structure. Originally there were a number of sort of frames here and you couldn't read the structure really of the uh, house. The um, uh, other spaces were uh, converted into office sp uh, spaces for the uh, uh, client and uh, a new bedroom was installed in the, in the place of the old bedroom. We changed the bed so you can sleep looking towards the view, which is really what this house is about. So the second project that will be discussed in some detail is the Eames house that Ravi will talk about. Yeah.
as many of you know, Charles and Ray Eames were both born in the early 20th century, and they met at Cranbrook in 1940. And uh, there they also met Eero Saarinen, who is not shown in the photo, uh, with whom they had a long relationship as friends and collaborators. Working together um, uh, in, the, in 1940 for the MoMA competition, uh, the organic design in home furnishings uh, competition was when uh, Saarinen and the Eameses bonded. Um, Saarinen and Eames actually received first prize for a chair that they designed for that competition and, uh, and continued to collaborate on other works. In 1941, uh, Charles divorced his first wife and married Ray, and they moved uh, together to Los Angeles, where they continued their experiments in furniture design. Um, so shown here are the Eameses with John Intenza, the founder of uh, Arts and Architecture magazine, and the Case Study House program. So uh, Intenza invited the Eameses and Sarinen to, to do two projects right next to each other. Um, and the, the first version of these houses were published together in Arts and Architecture in 1945 as Case Study House Number 8 um, and Case Study House Number 9 uh, um, as a pair, a joint venture project by Charles, and, uh, Charles Eames and Eero Sarinen. The magazine stated two houses for people of different occupations but parallel interests. Uh, case study nine was designed for Intenza himself, and that is the project on the right. Um, and the Eames house was designed as a prototype for a working couple. The property is about uh, 200 meters from the ocean. Um, the first version of the house was called the Bridge House. Designed in 1945, positioned uh, parallel to the coastline uh, with one end anchored to the bluff and the other end floating above uh, an open meadow. After some delay due to wartime shortages, the, the prefabricated steel components ordered in 1945 were finally delivered to si the site in 1948. And in, in this uh, interim, um, Charles and Ray modified the plan turning the structure 90 degrees um, to be parallel to the, the bluff instead of the ocean. And it's noted that it was done to maximize uh, the, sp the spanned components that were in the kit, but in reality the new orientation created a completely different relationship to the meadow. Uh, the view and the row of eucalyptus trees which existed on the site became very important and uh, having, having studied that for the, the years in the interim. And so this new orientation uh, allowed the, the, the open meadow to be acknowledged in a, in a better way. Uh, the, new, the new plan also abutted the house to the existing bluff uh, with a retaining wall and uh, with the topography lines sort of behind the retaining wall. The same uh, exact components were used to create a two-story structure with a double height living space um, facing the ocean. And uh, here you see the, the components being assembled and uh, a, a photo of the house nearly uh, a decade after its construction in 1958 and uh, full of objects. Visits to the, off to the house often end up in discussions about the collection of objects that occupy all the surfaces of the house. Um, architects especially are often surprised and, and confounded by uh, this array of visual stimuli that appears to compete with the, the, the clarity of this, this uh, modernist industrial structure. And much uh, discussion has taken place in trying to explain the collection 
historian Beatrice Colomina attributed this, uh, this kaleidoscopic excess of objects, as she said, to Ray Eames, who she described as a sublime pack rat. Um, Pat Kirkham described it as, a f as functioning decoration, uh, refuting the gender bias construction of holding Ro uh, Ray uh, responsible and cited Charles's interest in American arts and crafts movement and, uh, and finding a relationship between these crafts and post-war industrial design. Um, uh, curator Donald Albrecht, however, said for, for the Eames is that these objects in their homes uh, provided valuable lessons in, in uh, design truths, simple objects from the past, such as toys, uh, were for them historical artifacts that re revealed the same uh, elegance and truthfulness of material and craftsmanship that they sought in their own modern mass-produced work. Um, uh, Ray once told Pat Kirkham, we were not collectors of toys. We found things and kept them as examples of principles uh, of aspects of design. We kept it to show it to use it, to share it, and to give insight to others uh, and to ourselves. The Eameses were looking at objects from, from everything from nature to stones to plants, everyday objects, traditional crafts, and various cultural uh, objects and toys. They also obsessively documented what they saw, uh, amassing a catalog and slide library of uh, 250,000 slides, which are uh, which are now at the Library of Congress. Kites were also a, a particular f uh, fascination for the Eameses, and um, probably for their cultural expression, but also for their structural elegance. And uh, and these kites then uh, informed them also in the structure for their house. Uh, and, and you can see early drawings that, um, that the Eames has used that make this connection. Um, the structural concept of the kite appears in storage units as well. And in a toy which they designed as a kit of parts uh, similar to the house for people of all ages to configure by themselves for different purposes. Their interest in looking and documenting also translated into showing and explaining information through film and exhibition design. A film that they made in 1955 uh, on an exhibition that took place at uh, MoMA, uh, which was curated by Alexander Girard and Edgar Kaufman, um, on textiles and ornamental arts of India led to a special invitation from, uh, from Nehru, India's first prime minister. And um, this, uh, Nehru invited them to come to India and to research and advise the nation on ways that they could industrialize and modernize the production of goods um, without losing the country's culture of design and craft. For this, the Eames has spent three months in India traveling to various regions, observing and documenting the country's culture, uh, arts, crafts, and architecture, and the result of which was a paper called the India Report. They singled out a single object as an example of what should be the prototype for mass production in industrialized India, the traditional uh, water jug called a lota, while this object had evolved over centuries, they analyzed its qualities and how much liquid it held, how it's carried, how it's cleaned, and how it sounded. In short, the process of development of this simple object was to become a guide for how other objects should be designed and assessed in the new India. And these lessons were not only for India, but uh, were applied in the Eames office uh, itself. Throughout these years, from travels to foreign lands as well as in the United States, they amassed this uh, uh, amazing collection. Many of the items have no great monetary value, 
but were priceless for the, the lessons to be learned from the evolution of their design. Aside from the purely educational and analytical aspects of such a collection, it served to reflect the interests and delights of, of these two prolific designers. Charles once uh, recalled a conversation with Saarinen on the quality of good architecture, that the role of the architect or designer is that of a very good and thoughtful host, um, all of whose energy goes into anticipating the needs of his guests. He concluded, the house must make no insistent demands for itself, but rather aid as a background for life in work, uh, to act as a shock absorber. This house eventually served as a useful object to absorb all the history of its two occupants. In 2010, 18,000 of these objects, or I'm sorry, 1,800 of these objects, from the living room alone were loaned to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art for the exhibition Living in a Modern Way, um, California Design 1930 through 1965. Here you see the objects transferred to the museum in uh, an exhibition that was curated by Wendy Kaplan, the museum's head of decorative arts and design. A replica of the Eames living room was built in the museum to display the relocated collection, creating a window of opportunity for the Eames Foundation to address uh, some conservation issues on the house, starting with the now empty living room. Um, in the 60 years since the completion of the Eames house, um, the house aged in much the same way that any other house would. Um, but it's important to remember that the Eames house was very carefully designed, carefully built, and very carefully lived in, um, and as well as being looked after by its occupants. Um, the, the conservation of the Eames house, in fact, began uh, immediately after Ray's death to secure the house's survival. The Eames family set up a foundation that has maintained the house for the last several decades. As a result, the 60-year-old house is in re remarkable condition. The Eames Foundation also stated uh, goals uh, uh, that would be to uh, preserve the house for the next 250 years, uh, uh, seven generations, and this has something to do, to do with a, a Native uh, American philosophy that something should survive for at least seven generations. And uh, so the Eameses began um, uh, interviewing people for the restoration and invited us to, to walk through the house with them and would show us various uh, examples of conditions of uh, uh, surfaces and so forth and asked how we would treat uh, uh, these elements. And uh, in, in one case, uh, the, this crackler, uh, which existed on the on painted metal doors um, we thought should be just left exactly as it was because uh, it wasn't preventing um, its use and, and it, it also showed its age and, and we didn't think that one should uh, try to make this look brand new. Uh, at the same time there were other surfaces like the floor uh, which uh, originally was made out of a asbestos vinyl tile which had to be removed for, uh, for health and safety issues and, and the, the material had completely uh, deteriorated to the point that it was like walking on eggshells that uh, uh, it would break uh, uh, at, at um, every, every footstep. Um, so various uh, 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 programs in, in documenting the existing condition uh, was taken, uh, was undertaken by the office. And uh, the restoration um, of a, a project like this requires a small army of specialists and consultants. The projects are less about authorship of the con conservation architect and more about the collaboration uh, in general. Um, at the time, we were unaware that the, the Getty Conservation Institute was um, launching a new program called
called uh, Conserving Modern Architecture Initiative, CMAI. And the Getty House became the first uh, project in this program. And uh, we'll focus here on, on three aspects that were undertaken in, the f in phase one, um, which was the floor, and uh, then the building envelope, and the interior walls. We next uh, mapped all the different types of glass that, uh, from the building envelope um, that was used in the house, the original glass uh, pieces that had been uh, had been replaced um, due to cracks from earthquakes and, uh, and then various types of glass that were uh, uh, in the original project as well. Um, and along with it, uh, the condition of the functioning of the windows. Um, the lower frames had uh, rusted over time and uh, were in need of repair. So uh, extensive drawings were made and the conservation work began. Um, none of the, uh, the floor level hopper windows uh, functioned uh, at this point and so everything had to be carefully uh, removed and treated and, and uh, replaced or um, placed back in, uh, in functioning order. Here we see details of how uh, certain parts were replaced. And uh, the sliding glass doors had to be uh, taken apart and, and you see how the Eameses would often um, combine uh, wood with steel uh, even uh, in this very industrialized building that uh, when, when necessary, uh, these components were combined. So some of these, uh, the, the wood had deteriorated and had to be replaced. And uh, here you see the wheels. And uh, now we come to the interior woodwork. Um, a study was done. Uh, on, on what type of wood was used by the Getty, uh, identifying it as uh, eucalyptus, which tied it in to the type of wood that was also found in the garden. Um, and quite early on, we decided that we would not try to make this look like brand new, that the, the wear uh, and the, the stains that occurred in the wood uh, would be cleaned, but traces of its history would be maintained. And so here is uh, the sampling being done for determining the type of wood, the cleaning taking place, um, and, and to the right, uh, the restored wood wall. Uh, paint stratigraphy was also done to determine all the layers of paint that went into the, uh, that were applied on the metal surfaces. Um, uh, climate conditioning was studied uh, to, to trace uh, humidity in the house and so forth. Uh, we, we also compared the different types of uh, flooring that were uh, the conditions that were in the house and then tried to find as close to the original uh, asbestos tile or vinyl tile without the asbestos and uh, were able to trace um, a company that, that made uh, a very similar tile and, uh, and the work began. Um, uh, waterproofing also had to be carefully uh, dealt with for the floor. Here you see it being applied and the new tile being placed. And here you see the restored uh, living room um, from the phase one work. So I will now speak about, very briefly, about three projects that uh, uh, are really sort of influenced by uh, Rudolf Schindler. These are not restoration projects. Uh, you see here a plan of the uh, Schindler house, uh, a house that he did in 1920. It's now almost 100 years old. 
as radical today as it was when it was first built. Schindler describes the house as a place for two couples to, li to, uh, 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 to live uh, jointly together and uh, the house doesn't really have a program for the different spaces so instead every adult would have a studio, two studios share a bathroom and an entrance and they always share an outdoor space which essentially would act as the living room. The two units then share a kitchen. There is also a guest unit and a garage and on top of each of these units there was always what they called a sleeping basket, an outdoor sleeping uh, uh, area. So this house had uh, a really interesting uh, history, but it's also something that, uh, uh, because the spaces are, can be used in so many different ways, uh, we use this as a as, uh, uh, point of departure in a way for a project that we did a few months ago. We were asked by a, a, a magazine in Los Angeles to propose a, um, a new idea for housing. And we felt that the Schindler House was uh, really uh, one of the most interesting uh, uh, proposals on uh, spaces that can be used in many different ways. And so what we suggested was that we would stack the, Sch the Schindler house, uh, we would rotate uh, the house because it is in Los Angeles and the orientation really does not matter. The uh, 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 idea of rotating it uh, has to do uh, with the concept of chance and that refers to John Cage, and we'll speak about that in a second a little bit more, uh, and that this would then become this tower in Los Angeles. Uh, the two entrances uh, uh, then always appear in different places, and that's what dictates the location of these stairs. But we had done earlier uh, a project that was based on the history of the Schindler House. Uh, we were invited by the Museum of Applied Arts. Uh, they now run the Schindler House essentially as a satellite. It's a, a center for contemporary art and architecture. Uh, they invited a number of artists and architects in Los Angeles to propose a project uh, about the house and in particular about Pauline Schindler. And um, we uh, decided that um, the most interesting way to us was to create an opera. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, uh, we, uh, constructed a libretto uh, that uh, narrates the history of the uh, uh, main people there and very much the history of the house. Uh, this is uh, Rudolf Schindler and this is uh, the Schindlers and uh, um, uh, Pauline's parents in the house. The um, history of the building, uh, you may be uh, familiar with that, is one uh, uh, that is uh, really quite fascinating. Uh, Rudolf Schindler used this house as uh, really a calling card, uh, but it refers to ideas that he had developed and wrote about in 1912 in Vienna, when he was still in Vienna. So the libretto was really constructed from original text, text that Rudolf Schindler wrote text that Pauline Schindler wrote, correspondence between the two. And the music uh, 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 was a collection of uh, music by composers that Pauline Schindler either knew uh, or wrote about. So the first piece of music that one would hear uh, was uh, uh, from Prokofiev's uh, Scythian Suite because there is the story that Rudolf and Pauline Schindler met at the American premiere of this piece. It probably is not correct because chronologically it doesn't uh, make sense. Um, uh, there, were, uh, uh, there was music by uh, uh, Edgar Varese, uh, Schoenberg, uh, uh, Henry Cowell, and the entire third act was music by John Cage. John Cage actually lived in the house. Uh, he even had a uh, uh, relationship with Pauline Schindler. She was 20 years older, she was 40, he was 20. She introduced him to many important uh, musicians in Los Angeles. Uh, and he actually even wrote a piece that he dedicated to Pauline Schindler. So the music was then performed by a trio um, uh, in, uh, uh, in the house. 
while the singers actually completely improvised the vocal line. Uh, uh, this uh, again refers to what in John Cage's work is called chance music, but there's also uh, in music theory there is a term called aleatoric music, and that is, uh, again, it has to do with uh, music being uh, uh, improvised. Uh, uh, and uh, this vocal line then sort of appeared above the uh, uh, instrumental line. Uh, another piece that uh, uh, has to do with Schindler and really sort of bridges our interests of architectural history and contemporary art is a, uh, a piece we did with the American conceptual artist Stephen Prina. Prina approached us uh, because he had uh, about 20 years earlier had seen some built-in furniture uh, that he recognized as uh, coming from a Schindler house. They had been ripped out, they were being sold. Uh, they were painted pink and he said that this image was sort of seared in his mind. He then decided to rebuild all of the built-in furniture of two no longer existing Schindler houses. One is the Harris house, one is the Heiler house. Uh, and he uh, uh, approaches to assist him uh, with this. So we worked off of the original Schindler drawings, first identifying every piece, creating 3D uh, 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 drawings of these, and then from these, creating very precise uh, working drawings, much more precise than anything Schindler would have ever done. The furniture was then built uh, in uh, Vienna, and it was then uh, uh, painted pink again by uh, uh, Stephen Prina, and it was first shown at the secession in Vienna. The idea of the pink uh, makes reference to uh, the fact that Pauline Schindler, when she lived in the house uh, after they separated, painted her side of the house uh, in a more salmon color than, than, than uh, uh, pink. Uh, the, the same project was then later shown at uh, the, uh, LACMA in Los Angeles. So uh, now I want to uh, also very briefly speak about some recent and current projects in uh, the office. This is the so-called pilot house uh, by the architects A. Quincy Jones, Whitney Smith, and the structural engineer Edgardo Contini. And it was really the model for what is called the Crestwood Hills uh, development, which was a post-war cooperative housing um, uh, uh, development uh, that was done to deal with, to show how to deal with the shortage of housing in post-war Los Angeles. Uh, the Crestwood Hills development is close to the Getty, if you know Los Angeles, while the model house was built very close to downtown so people could see that and then decide whether they wanted to live uh, 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 out in Brentwood. It's a very small, very modest house built entirely out of wood. Uh, but this is what it looked like when our client bought it. Surfaces had been painted white. Uh, there was uh, a general sort of um, uh, signs of uh, uh, very uh, badly aged uh, building. Here, uh, uh, we actually spent months peeling off, stripping the paint from all of the surfaces to then reveal this incredibly beautiful plywood uh, house and so we were able to get this back to its current uh, condition. Another current project is an unbuilt Lautner house that we are currently building. This is a guest house from 1958. And our uh, task here was to translate the original drawings into first a 3D model and actually addressing here many sort of uh, uh, geometric inconsistencies that Lautner would have worked out during construction uh, that we could uh, uh, address in the model. This, I should say, is the first time and the only time that the Lautner Foundation is allowing uh, an unbuilt project to be built, and it's only because the client has the exact piece of land that this house was uh, designed for. So this is uh, now about uh, uh, built about up to here, the concrete part. A project that we are currently working on is the reconstruction of a house by Gregory Ayn that burned down last November in Silver Lake with the only known set of drawings. Uh, here you see the house after it be, uh, uh, was cleaned up a, a tiny little bit. So we uh, 
first had to convince the insurance company to not tear the house down because we had to measure everything. And uh, we then found in the Gregory Ain archive at UC Santa Barbara uh, a presentation drawing that was uh, unidentified, but we realized that that was the plan of uh, our house. Uh, Gregory Ain was a really interesting architect. He um, uh, uh, was very uh, uh, preoccupied with the idea of affordable housing. After the war, he built a number of uh, cooperative houses. Uh, because of that, he was considered to be a communist, and the FBI essentially sort of sh uh, uh, cut his career off around 1950. While we were working on this, we realized that this plan was very similar to the house that Gregory Ain had done in 1950 at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. There was this, uh, a program of houses being built uh, in the courtyard of MoMA. So we were then able to get the drawings of the MoMA house and based on that and based on the measurements that we took, we were able to recreate a new set of working drawings. This is actually the plan of the MoMA house that shows similarities to our house. So this is uh, now we have started construction and it is uh, uh, scheduled to be completed next summer. These are renderings that we then created from the 3D model. Another uh, uh, project that we're currently working on is the house that Paul Williams built for himself. Uh, Paul Williams, and Ravi will speak more about him, uh, was a very uh, uh, important uh, African-American architect uh, who worked in Los Angeles starting in the 1930s and we are currently restoring his own house uh, which is uh, uh, in relatively okay condition but it is uh, uh, for us an extremely interesting uh, uh, project because we are uh, uh, being uh, uh, we're able to study the work of an architect that we uh, did not know much about until now. So uh, Paul Williams was known for his adeptness in designing in various styles and his, uh, these skills he developed uh, to keep his practice economically viable. As a minority architect, uh, he had to be able to design um, where, wherever it was needed in whatever style his clients asked for. Williams was born in 1894 and died in 1980. Um, he was adopted by a somewhat affluent couple after his parents died of tuber tuberculosis at age four. And he went on to study at USC. And in 1923 was the first black architect to become a member of the American Institute of Architects. In 1957, he was the first black fellow to be inducted to the AIA. And he created over um, 2,500 buildings in a career spanning uh, uh, roughly 60 years. Um, among early works were interiors for Saks Fifth Avenue uh, that uh, in, in buildings designed by Donald Parkinson in the 1930s in, in Beverly Hills. And, uh, and he was later hired to do expansions uh, to that building as well as other interiors uh, over the next uh, 20 years. Um, following his service in the Navy as uh, an architect during World War II, he published two books, The Small Home of Tomorrow in 1945 and New Homes for Today the following year. Uh, and these books, um, through these books, he disseminated dozens of modernist floor plans for the middle class to use in building their own homes. He was known for his, uh, the fluency of uh, the different styles that he designed in, and uh, through this, um, he eventually was uh, invited by various celebrities uh, to design their homes. Um, so Frank Sinatra um, and Lucille Ball, Desi Arnaz, Cary Grant, Anthony Quinn and Danny Thomas were among his clients. And uh, many of these uh, uh, houses have also been owned by uh, current celebrities as well, such as uh, Denzel Washington and, and Ellen DeGeneres. 
In the 1940s, he was hired to design interiors um, and a new brand for the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, his granddaughter, um, Karen Hudson, noted that her grandfather had to make many pragmatic adjustments to the reality of racism in, in the day. He taught himself to draw upside down so, uh, so that white clients would not be uncomfortable sitting next to him. And uh, Karen Hudson said it became one of the things he was known for. Uh, he often toured uh, construction sites with his hands clasped behind his back like a British royal because he wasn't sure everyone would want to shake the, the, his hands. So he gave them the option of extending their hands first. Um, many of the neighborhoods uh, in which his homes uh, were located were closed to him because of his race. Um, a. Quincy Jones, who had worked for Williams uh, in, his, in his youth, uh, developed a lifelong friendship with, uh, with Williams and later invited him to collaborate with him on several projects, um, uh, including the Palm Springs Racquet Club, the Town and Country Club, and various other housing projects. Uh, Jones, who was one of the partners in the Mutual Housing Corporation, um, the pilot house which we saw earlier, um, uh, and, uh, and that project, uh, um, Crestwood Hills and the Mutual Housing um, Project, started out with no race barriers. And, and for that, he was also seen as a suspect character and, and traced by the FBI for a while. Um, and uh, this is a project that Jones and Williams uh, worked on together, one of seven uh, uh, large housing projects. Williams went on to design hundreds of commercial and ins institutional buildings, but uh, remained somewhat invisible because of his race. And uh, through, his gran uh, through his granddaughter, uh, who has been um, uh, documenting all his work and publishing various books, uh, she's, uh, she's trying to rectify this situation. He was one of the architects involved in seeing to fruition the Los Angeles Airport theme building in 1960. Uh, the next project is actually uh, a church, uh, and we were approached about 10 years ago um, by the newly arrived vicar uh, of this church in Lincoln Heights to help in restoring the building. Um, a previous master, uh, conservation master plan had been funded by the Getty Conservation Institute, but the actual work was now uh, urgently needed. Uh, Epiphany is the oldest surviving Episcopal church in Los Angeles. The older churches of St. Athanasius and St. Paul, uh, both wooden churches or wooden structures which once stood downtown um, were relocated and eventually demolished. Uh, so Epiphany is the, the oldest standing uh, church. The church was built in three steps. Um, the chapel um, that was built in 1888 um, uh, by an architect named Ernest Coxhead who was born in Sussex and uh, arrived in LA in, in the mid-1880s. Uh, Coxhead became a prominent uh, church architect and built several churches um, throughout uh, Central and Southern California. And uh, it was noted that because of uh, a preference for Gothic, uh, English Gothic by Protestant denominations, that his British accent served him well. In 1900, uh, Arthur B. Benton was commissioned to design an expansion to this church. Um, Benton was born in Illinois in 1858 and arrived in LA in the 1890s. Um, he worked for various railroad companies and eventually ends up in LA um, and founds the California Landmarks Club, uh, which was concerned with the preservation of uh, Spanish and Mexican missions. Uh, Benton supervised the restoration of San Juan Capistrano and San Diego missions and uh, became a proponent of the mission revival style. 
And so you see here, uh, th uh, the expansion was a mixture of shingle style and Spanish revival and Gothic elements. Um, the tall tower at the rear was first added as a choir room for the church in 1901 and uh, which then became uh, the altar for the sanctuary when um, the nave was added in 1914. The, uh, the original chapel uh, at the far left then became the parish hall. The church is uh, situated in one of the earliest suburbs of Los Angeles. Um, however, by uh, the mid-1900s, uh, mid it had become a, uh, a, a, a neighborhood comprised mostly of working poor and recent immigrants from Latin America. Um, while the church buildings themselves are of great importance, the real period of significance for the church was the 1960s civil rights era. The church was one of the first to acknowledge and incorporate cultural traditions of its parishioners in the 1960s, mostly Mexican Americans uh, who lived in the neighborhood. In, in following a movement called liberation theology, the church's priests uh, and congregation began organizing and supporting various uh, social justice activities. They uh, supported Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, um, the Chicano walkouts, uh, protest, protesting mistreatment of Latin American students in the school system, and the Chicano moratorium, uh, the Brown Berets, and the Chicano movement as a whole. Uh, a now famous newspaper called La Raza was a key element of the movement and was published in the basement of the church. In 2005, uh, the church was unanimously declared a Los Angeles historic cultural monument by the city council for its role in the Chicano civil rights movement. Uh, by this period, however, the church was in a, st a state of disrepair, mostly from a lack of funds for maintenance um, the original stone wall from the 1880s chapel had eroded and was leaning outward, threatening uh, collapse. The foundations needed repair and seismic retrofitting was needed as well. Through a series of fundraisers in collaboration with artist friends, we were able to complete a first phase, uh, which included some critical repairs. Um, a wheelchair ramp was added, making it uh, fully accessible. And, uh, and the stone walls were then uh, dismantled and reconstructed with proper footings and backing structure. Four large stained glass window uh, panels, uh, which had been buckling after 100 years of exposure to harsh weather, had to be completely removed and uh, repaired. We were able to work with Judson Studios uh, a manufacturer in Los Angeles who had done many of the older, oldest churches in Los Angeles. And here you see the work in pro, uh, progress and, uh, and then the churches, the, the windows were uh, replaced in the church. Uh, the new activity also brought much public awareness to the church and support from the community. Uh, last year, I co-curated an exhibition titled The Art of Protest, uh, gathering work um, by artists from the movement in the 1960s, as well as from contemporary artists who continue um, the social justice work uh, in the neighborhood. Here you see works mounted on the walls of the sanctuary. Epiphany was recently recognized by the National Trust uh, the, uh, the Trust for Historic Preservation, and received a grant from a program called Partners in Preservation last year, and is now uh, in progress on a matching uh, grant uh, campaign, ma matching funds campaign from the National Fund for Sacred Places. So I'm going to end with uh, showing you very briefly three projects that uh, all have to do with building in the context of, uh, of these uh, uh, works. We're quite often uh, uh, asked to deal with this situation. So one is a guest house that we 
uh, proposed for the chemosphere, where we wanted the chemosphere to be the central uh, building in this whole uh, composition. Uh, we wanted the guest house to have the same elevation, but we wanted it to have a very different relationship to the ground. So the guest house that we proposed was this uh, uh, a building that was sort of wedged into this ravine, as I uh, said, at the same height above the street as the chemosphere. We also proposed a pool on the other side, again wanting it to be at the same elevation as the house, a wall that creates a dam, uh, and uh, uh, where this part here is, is the pool, the water held back by this wall. Uh, a second project was, uh, came out of a, uh, a commission from uh, the Getty uh, Research, Research Institute and it was done at the time of the uh, Lautner exhibition. Uh, four architects were invited to propose a hypothetical addition to a Lautner house and uh, we uh, worked on the Elrod house. And the Elrod house in Palm Springs, it's, it is a fabulous place but there are no places for books. And we felt that that uh, uh, had to be addressed. And so what we proposed was uh, a sort of secret library uh, that you would access through this sort of stair carved into the rock. And you would descend into this space that was cut into the, into the mountain. Uh, uh, and so all the surfaces would be rock. And in, uh, in here you would have uh, just these sort of stacks of uh, books. So this was a hypothetical uh, uh, project and this is what it would, would have looked like at night. Uh, but this is a project that we're currently working on in Los Angeles and it's uh, the restoration of the 1960 uh, Richard Neutra designed sale residence. Our client uh, uh, wanted to add to the house uh, uh, among other things a, a master bedroom a guest house and a studio where he uh, he's a uh, very well-known chef where he can sort of uh, experiment and what we proposed was that all of these additions should be essentially cut into the hill the master bedroom is accessed from the house the others are accessed through the garden and you would have these sort of series of concrete volumes that project out from the hill so to uh, not interfere with the house itself. So this is a section through the master bedroom and the stair coming down uh, from the house, uh, a volume that contains bathroom and organizes the space. This is a view of the bedroom looking into the space and looking out towards the view. The uh, kitchen studio, which you would access uh, from the garden via this stair in the back uh, uh, with uh, uh, entering into the kitchen and a small dining area and again the view out. And lastly the guest house which you would access from the back again coming through the garden and uh, a, a, a sort of a shaped wooden volume that contains bathroom stor storage and organizes the rest of the space into a living and two sleeping areas. So these are some things that we're working on right now. Thank you for your attention.